I'm always looking right. up in the corner after Representative Conquest noticed that we weren't live one time, but we are now streaming live on YouTube. YouTube, and this is the Monday morning uh, appropriate House Appropriations Committee meeting. And first on our welcome, everybody. It's good to see you. You had a nice weekend and enjoyed. Well, there's more sun again today, but at least it was beautiful yesterday. Um, Bob Helm is not available to join us today. <clears throat> Linda, you will not be available on Thursday. Is that correct? Thursday. And is there anybody else who has a conflict uh, conflict for the rest of this week? No. Um, first on our agenda, uh, right at 11 o'clock, we have Commissioner Gresham. And he was going, and he is going to, not was, he is going to... Um, go over with the committee, the instructions that were sent out to the departments regarding um, the quarter year bill that, um, that, we, that we are beginning our work on. So welcome, Adam, it's always good to see you. Uh, nice to be here, thank you for inviting me. I would also note that my colleagues, um, Deputy Commissioner Riven and Budget Director uh, Rich Donahue are also on the conference. Um, and so we are fully manned in case any question goes awry. We'll have oh. someone who can answer it. Um, thank you. And I see Matt Riven. Um, Matt Riven is just in the waiting room. So we'll, let's wait a minute until he gets in. Uh, Matt, are you here? Matt Riven, are you, did you join us? I did. Thank you. Excellent. It's nice to see you. Thank you for joining us. Nice Rich Donahue, nice to see you too. Um, Adam, we're going to let you take it away. The committee uh, received the, the letter that you sent out and I don't know if you have paper copies, but if you don't have a paper copy for notes, Teresa has just put the, the letter up on the screen for us. Right, I'll be uh, talking from this letter. So on May 12th, uh, we sent out budget instructions for the Q1 only budget uh, for fiscal 21. Um, and it, it, if there's any better way to acknowledge the fact that we're in a bright new world, I don't know what it is uh, since my uh, colleagues in finance and management as well as the governor's staff spent an awful lot of time this past fall working up a budget which we submitted with you and I know you spent a number of months on and we are effectively throwing that out the door um, and we are settling for the first quarter of 21 on a one quarter budget. So these instructions um, have uh, were sent out to departments on the 12th, just basically telling them what we were looking for and what would be in the budget. And the first thing I would point out is um, there, there are really uh, kind of two components to it, as you see. One is the appropriations, and we are going to use a language uh, format. We're not, so in that B section where you see uh, pages and pages of numbers, uh, we are not going to be uh, using that. Um, the numbers will be there. Um, we'll be calling on the FY20, um, adjusted budget numbers um, so that the numbers exist but we are not going to be putting them in this budget uh, it's going to be a language format only uh, as we'll see in a moment uh, and we're also including uh, legislative language that needs to typically go in a budget to make sure that we can keep the wheels turning to make sure that any uh, requirements or uh, statutory language that is necessary um, is in there. So it's not that we're completely dispensing with it, but uh, so we will be putting in necessary language, uh, sometimes referred to as boilerplate language, other times, um, you know, that would keep a, a specific program uh, going uh, that requires uh, renewal. So you will see that in the budget that we ultimately submit to. Um, so there will be uh, an appropriations and a language section in the budget. In the actual, in the appropriations sections, um, the governor um, has 
decided that we will use a uh, percentage amount for each department. Um, and we've kind of delineated funding sources to determine the percentage amount. I think the uh, percentage that you're um, that we're most familiar with is the general fund. And there we are setting a 23% of the Act 88, which is the FY20 enacted budget adjustment uh, that was signed by the governor this past March. We're going to use 23% of each department and agency's FY20 BAA first quarter amount. So on an annualized basis, that would amount to the equivalent of an 8% reduction, keeping in mind that the current revenue, the most recent revenue forecast we have, which was April 28th, um, I believe was calling for a, a better than, uh, I'm gonna say 15% um, reduction in uh, FY21 revenue. So we don't think we're being too severe um, in what we're uh, asking departments to do. and. Indeed, it may end up being kind of a, a, a dry run of what ultimately later on this summer when we do a full fiscal 21 budget. So and that is I for uh, general funding. Yes. I just want to jump in quickly for committee sure. members. Um, let's hold, let, let's write all of our questions down so that Adam can get all the way through the, the presentation of the budget instructions and then we'll move to the, the questions after that. So the, sure. the flow and the overall thinking of your direction forward. So for uh, federal funded departments um, or departments that have multiple sources of funding, including federal funds, uh, we are funding that at 25% of the FY20 appropriation and assuming departments um, have the funds there, and we're aware that there's been no change, um, but we are assuming that one, a fully one quarter of the FY20 um, budget adjustment amount will be used in Q1 FY21. Uh, for the transportation fund, I think people are aware there's uh, a seasonality issue with transportation. Uh, they typically will uh, burn through a little over half of their appropriation in FY20. So we are making that adjustment with the exception of the JTOC appropriation, which we're leaving at 25%. And, uh, you know, again, this reflects uh, construction uh, and the like. And we worked with the AOT to make sure that we were more or less on uh, target for what they anticipate. We also looked through uh, our vision statements to ensure that that is correct. Uh, with education funds, uh, we initially in our instructions had uh, pointed to a 30% appropriation from the education fund, which reflects the timing of uh, the first payment, which is in September, to local education associations. Um, subsequently, we've realized that might be a little bit low, and we, I think, will move that up to 33-34% uh, of the appropriations. But again, that is not meant to be um, a increase or a reduction. It's meant to align with what we anticipate the uh, funding requirement will be for um, the uh, first of three payments to the uh, schools, local education districts. And then for special funds for IDT, internal service and other funds, we are uh, leaving that 25% of uh, the FY20 BAA appropriation. And, you know, we expect that one for special funds that departments will let us know if they expect a, a change in their special funding allotments uh, based on recent developments uh, for IDT and particularly for internal service funds. Uh, we are thinking that the full, because of the complexity, particularly of internal service funds, uh, we are assuming that in the FY21 budget, we will do a full um, review of internal service funds. And importantly, if uh, departments uh, that are typically general funded are receiving uh, reduced targets that we would hold those for many of the internal service fund departments like BGS, for example, uh, my department, finance and management, uh, DHR and the like, we will hold them to that same target um, 
regardless of whether they're internal service fund or general fund. But we, that's, uh, you know, the math is a little bit more complicated because we have to dole out department to department on that. So we thought we would leave that for the full budget year. But we have communicated with departments that they can anticipate that when we uh, get to them later on this summer. So we uh, gave these um, instructions to our departments. We asked them to get back to us uh, by Friday, the, the Friday that just passed, if they had uh, any comments uh, or um, if they thought it would be a hardship or there's stuff that we didn't know about. Um, I don't wanna get ahead of our budget submission to you, which we expect soon, um, but I, I will say that um, there were a number of departments that got back to us uh, that led us to make some adjustments um, in those instructions to comport with uh, various requirements or spending patterns that they have that we may not have noticed when we issued the instructions. We also, for uh, operational language, uh, we asked departments to let us know uh, any language that is a must uh, have um, starting off the year. Uh, and we collected a language that uh, is required, I think um, the committee will find that the language that we ultimately submit to you is um, somewhat reduced from what we normally submit. Um, but, you know, there is, again, some language that needs to go in the Q1 budget. And then, um, you know, we concluded uh, by saying that uh, the revenue estimates, as I think people know, are subject to change. Uh, we have to use the most recent revenue estimates, uh, which uh, were made, I think, April 28th, to the extent that we have an updated forecast that changes things um, to a significant extent. We will adopt our budget instructions um, or our ultimate budget that we submit to you accordingly. Uh, we do not anticipate that there will be significant changes. Uh, I'm sure that you know every revenue forecast has some changes, but at this point, we're not anticipating any significant changes. Uh, and we are acknowledging that the two percent for the first quarter, you know, is an eight percent full year reduction. Um, and you know, I would say this is meant to be um, really a heads up that you know I think we we have some challenging discussions uh, coming up. And I think this kind of gets us off, in, in, in a sense, it gets us a head start on what we anticipate will be a challenging year and um, you know, kind of puts us in the right frame of mind. So I will uh, end there. I'm sure there are questions that uh, you folks have and let's uh, let me see if I can answer them. Need to unmute myself. We do have a few questions, uh, Dave. Thank you. Um, a couple of uh, questions. If I'm budgeting um, for 25% federal, and presumably that that usually takes some general fund match, but my general fund has been reduced, could that mean that I may have to reduce more significantly? non-matching general fund so that I have the general fund to do the match or in reality is everything leveraged? Huh. Um, well. Did, did, did I make myself clear? Yes. Th thank yeah. you. Um, I was gonna look at Matt as a, what he had as a general answer. So to representative, if, if I'm understanding your question, um, if there is a grant that uh, that gets paid evenly throughout the year and uh, therefore requires 25% uh, of the budgeted federal funds to be expended, but there's um, not sufficient general funds to match that, um, then I think that we would view that as similar to um, a, a general fund expense in that we would ask the department, well, um, how, what, what opportunities can you take to um, limit or reduce expenses um, such that you can stay in within your total expenditures? Um, but one thing that we have incorporated and I think already exists under law is that um, for departments where they cannot, uh, simply cannot 
stay within their general fund limit, they could come to the emergency board um, in July and request an increase in general funds. So if, if their ability to uh, leverage full federal match was somehow impinged, um, there is a mechanism where they could exceed the 23% on the general fund side. Okay, uh, another uh, area, if I may, Madam Chair, just moving on. Um, do you anticipate policy changes that may require, unless there's notwithstanding, uh, rulemaking or public notices, et cetera, in the area of program eligibility that might not start until the, um, at the beginning of the second quarter, but the policy rules will need to be approved in the first quarter in order to get a full nine months of savings. We, it, I mean, by nature, the fact that this is a skinny budget, uh, we are not anticipating certainly including that in the budget. Um, and in terms of policy changes, I think you're aware that everything will be on the table come this summer. Um, I can't you know, anticipate or not anticipate changes, but um, in the skinny budget, we are not including the um, kind of a head start on policy changes that may or may not be made over the summer. So you think they all can be compressed within a nine month period and get you the savings you might be recommending? That would have to be the case if we made changes and we would acknowledge that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Dave. Are, are you finished? Yes. We can come back. Um, I have Mary Kimberly Chip. Um, thank you. I, I read the budget instructions a while ago and I failed to appreciate that I didn't understand what it means to talk about doing an, a language only format. Are, are you suggesting, and, and so not doing the individual members section, are, are yeah. you suggesting that we are just doing appropriating one number? rather than making appropriations to each department? No, um, I'm suggesting that each department would receive their target. So every department, every agency will have a number associated with uh, spending, um, but we would not be including a full section, uh, B section that has literally every department um, on it in the budget document itself. But every department will receive a target um, of, you know, on their funding source, 23% or 25% of Q1 FY20 budget adjustment. Um, so every department will have a, a target, but it's just not going to be in the, in the actual budget document. We and just, just to uh, elaborate, yeah. so the, the language in the bill will say, um, all general fund appropriations shall be 23% of uh, the amount appropriated in Act 88. Um, but as we discussed with JFO, they will I believe they will provide to you a spreadsheet that shows how that um, translates into uh, an appropriation amounts. Um, and we will in turn will need um, something in that format in order to, um, from a technical standpoint, stand those appropriations up in the, in the system. Okay, thank you. Um, and just, the, the just, second- just if, I, if you don't mind, Representative, just to follow up on that. I mean, every finance and management was in contact with every department to give them a target number. So they were on the same page with them in that regard. And they have a target for general fund or special fund and the like. Uh, it's just that, you know, to, to Matt's point, it's not going to be in that budget doc. Well, so I think I understand the process. The, there's just a mechanical issue of how we actually appropriate it. And if we should disagree with you about the across the board 23% of the prior year's budget, mm -hmm. We'll just have, to, there's a mechanical process for mm -hmm. accomplishing that and we'll, we'll figure it out. Understood. Um, could, could you please talk to us about how you, um, Pay Act is being managed within this proposal? 
So as um, the committee is aware, um, the FY20 Pay Act will be annualized and baked into the FY21 base. Um, and the FY21 Pay Act, as far as I am aware, has not passed yet. Um, so uh, we are uh, waiting to see whether that passes and if it does, if there are any changes or whether the agreement the administration reached uh, with the uh, um, union is accepted. So that is not reflected yet in the budget, but FY20 annualization pay act is, you know, in the FY21 base. And help me with my recollection, the 21 agreement was the $1,400 across the board increase rather than kind of the traditional um, step increases plus a negotiated increase. Am I remembering that correctly? So, it, it, yes, <laughs> yeah, it was a different animal. Um, the, it was a, an upfront lump sum paid in July. Uh, it did have step increases. It did not have a COLA. So the lump sum was in substitute for the cost of living uh, increase, but it uh, did have step increases. And then the following year, it was more of a traditional step in COLA. The following year being 22. That's correct. Um, so clearly, if we're doing a quarter of a year, we're going to have to think about that differently. And I'll just set that aside and we'll have that conversation around the Pay Act. But it, right. it is a piece of this moving picture that we're going to need to think about how it works. Agreed. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Kimberly, Chip, and Marty. Hi, um, and I think I heard this correctly and I'm just confirming. Uh, Adam, I think you said the, the deduction or the percentage would be taken from the fiscal year 20 enacted budget adjustment. So any of the federal grants that are coming in, any of the transfer authority, including the enhanced transfer authority that uh, that, what is it, 250,000 now, none of that would be taken into account. Is that correct? Um, could you, I'm sorry, the enhanced transfer theory, I'm, I'm not sure what you're referring to. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about um, the last conversation about, um, it hasn't yet passed, but it's the idea that there could be uh, interdepartmental transfers up to 250,000 rather than the current 50,000. Kimberly, oh, that's no. going to stop at the end of fiscal year 20. Right. That was- Oh, okay. Temporary, right. Okay, thank you. I forgot. Mm -hmm. All right. But, but so just back to the other part though, there's not a reflection, just to be clear, in terms of all any of the federal grants that have been coming in after the budget adjustment enactment, correct? Uh, that would be right. Okay. Kimberly, are you finished or? Yes. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Chip and Marty. Uh, hi, Adam. I have a question that has to do with one of my budgets, but I'll ask it um, in case it uh, is true ever anywhere else. Um, so the Defender General um, sent me and some others a memo saying that it looked, it looked like the 2% has been applied to his annual, his whole budget rather than, um, rather than the first quarter. Um, and then, and then that, that amount taken from the first quarter. Um, is that, do you know if that is true and if, if it was intentional and if so, why? So I saw um, the Defender General's note. Um, I they are being treated just like every other department. I'm not sure I saw the difference with the Defender General um, versus other departments. I think you know he's merely saying that two percent a quarter annualizes to eight percent. So in effect, it's like he's getting an eight percent reduction. Um, that's 
true as taken, but it's no different than our other departments. Okay, I mean, it, whether there was some mistake in the process or or his understanding of what it was, but it, I asked him, I mean, he's, I just wanted to double check with him. He's clear that he thinks the entire 8% has been taken out of his first quarter, but you're telling me that, that they weren't treated any different and, and we'll get it worked out. I, I just wanted to make sure oh, yeah, he wasn't any- They're on the same page as everyone else. Being, okay. All right, thank you. You're thank welcome. you, Jeff. Uh, Marty. Yeah, I have two questions. I just need a little clarity on when you talk about we won't see, it'll be language as opposed to real numbers. I, I'm trying to think of an example of a, for instance, an agency would have a $400 million annual budget. So a quarter would be a hundred. And so we're not counting on a hundred for this next quarter, we're counting on 92. And, and so they will be told you may spend 92 million as opposed to what would have been 100%, or what would have been 25% of the whole year. But then will we see within this if what they're gonna spend on personnel and what they're gonna spend on various operational issues or will there just be a flat number of 92 million for that quarter? I'm wondering if we'll see the detail of how they intend to spend that portion that they're allowed to spend. Um, first of all, I think um, if uh, they have a $400 budget with $100 a quarter, they would spend 98 per quarter. So, um, and then, you know, 98. Okay, so my math's off, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that, um, and in terms of how they will spend it, in other words, the various details, um, I don't think our intention is to put that in the skinny bill. Um, that would be underlying the numbers that um, are applicable for each department, but I don't think the budget detail will be there. That's, that, that's correct. There, there, there simply isn't the time or, or opportunity to uh, right. to revisit everybody's um, budgets. And, and to Adam's earlier point, that would involve um, some policy decisions, which we've tried to keep out of the first quarter budget. So uh, no, but given that it tees off of the, um, off of the FY20 BAA, I think that the most accurate picture of a department's budget construct would be the um, FY20 budget, but recognize that there are certain pieces that uh, that will have moved somewhat from then, but that would be the, the, I think the best picture of their detail. But it would seem to me a department, knowing that they're gonna be reduced by this 2% and eventually 8% over the whole year, I would think that perhaps some departments may want to shift emphasis within their department. Um, and yes, I guess that's a policy change. Right. So that rather than just going along at 2% less for everything that they have, they may see strategically that they would be better off putting those reductions in one area as opposed to another. And I, frankly, would think they would want to look at that. And then, frankly, I'd like to take a look at what their decisions were. But your intention is not that they would spell out exactly where they would pull that 2% from. They would just squeeze everything by 2%. Well, we're asking departments to find those savings as they know best how. I mean, I guess you know, one way is for us to tell them, but we're really not in the position to tell departments what's well, best for them. Yeah. So we would ask them to. No, I wouldn't tell them either, but I would think they might have some ideas. They may. Right. So, uh, my, my other question is, why Marty, is it only a 2% cut? I would think we're looking at much greater cuts necessary later on. And why start out with only a 2% cut? Right, and you know that's a fair question. I, I would say that 
partly because of the um, tight time frame, we thought something even more dramatic might require a lot more input and a lot more work and cause a fair amount more disorientation. We just thought that we would start down the road making some reduction and frankly, uh, you know, in keeping in mind that there will be a full-fledged consensus revenue forecast in August, <clears throat> we, we didn't want to cause too much um, dislocation or disorientation early on, if only, you know, in August, we would have to say only kidding. Um, so we thought this would be a reasonable compromise to, to start down the road of reduction um, and you know, at least get a head start on it. And I would also, you know, say, keep in mind that this summer we will be, as you'd imagine, doing a fair amount of work on the budget. So this is an ongoing discussion. And if during the summer departments determine, hey, you know, here's, a, maybe we want to save a bit more here, a bit less there and shift funds, they will be able to do that. Um, they will be able to do that, but uh, or you know certainly uh, make plans to do that. Uh, so it's not like once we submit this budget, things are over for two months. This is kind of a ongoing discussion that's going to go on, you know, pulling through the summer. Okay. So before I move to Dave and Diane, I wanted to just continue with Marty's with Marty's questions. I, I have I, I don't understand quite how some of the timing is going to work because even they can't continue on with business as usual, even just making a 2% cut. And it seems like some of the work would have to start uh, for cutting maybe some programs that the legislature might be interested in weighing in on. And if we come back in September, you're not going to re realize even a 9%, I, I mean a nine month savings because we wouldn't have had time to do our work and vet these issues. And so really the most savings I would see would probably be six months of savings. But how do we, how do we handle um, knowing that they're going to be doing, not just proposing the cuts, but it seems like they're gonna to have to start laying the found work, um, you know, the found work, I'm sorry, the foundation for, um, for these reductions and then reeling them back in if those aren't the reductions the legislature would make. I, I just, the timing piece, I'm, I'm conflicted because I can't understand how it can work. You just can't take a 2% cut and not impact any programs. And you know maybe we'd rather see an entire program go and keep a bunch of things whole than 2% across the board. So how do we, how do we, how do we work together and, and not find ourselves in awe, at odds in August and September. And how do we do this work in four months um, if we're only going to give a three month budget and be ready for the fourth month? It seems like we'd almost have to do a four or five month budget is to, for, for the legislature to turn this budget around in just a couple of weeks and for the Senate to do their work in the time for the governor to sign it, we're going to be well past um, a September, mid-September date and maybe into October. This is looking more cumbersome to me, I think. Is, any, is anyone following a thing I had to say? Um, <laughs> I, I'm just really nervous that the timing's not working for any of this. Right. Uh, Kitty, I think, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mary. No, go ahead, sorry. Well, I, I think that's precisely the issue that Marty and Dave were asking. If, yeah, if yeah, exactly. we don't begin this process now, there's going to be a much more profound effect later on. Um, and in fact, is, you know, we may be looking for all of those savings, but having to do it over a six month period, which means it's twice as much as it would have been if we'd done it over a one year period. Right. So the math doesn't work in, to our advantage. So maybe right. we should be thinking about a longer skinny budget that gives us, I don't know, never mind. But, but yeah. Yeah, I, 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 you're absolutely right, Mary. And, I, and my questions are coming from Marty and Dave, but my question is these reductions are going to have to start the, found, the, the, the foundation, the work of it's going to have to start and that train's gonna be going down the road 
where usually we get a proposal for a reduction, but I can see where the actions are going to have to start taking place. And, and then if we have to pull all that back and do it, I'm, I'm really confused how this is going to work in August and to get enough reduction to fill the year and an agreement upon on what those reductions should be. That's, that's what I'm concerned about and whether we can even get this work done for the three quarter bill in this little narrow August 15 to mid September. Because if it has to be voted out and signed by September 30th, that would give us three weeks to do our work for a whole budget at the most. Um, uh, Diane and then Dave. Thank you. I'll just chime in on that and then I'll ask a question. It, se it seems like we're trying to put off what we really know we need to do and then it becomes more dramatic and more impacting at that, at that time than to start to do the work, like everybody said, over a year, not just five or six months. But, um, uh, you know, to that end, are, is there sort of a expectation that there'll be some sort of rescue operation from the feds that maybe we don't have to go? Are you, are you, are we going just the, you know, the 23 and not the 20% because we're thinking come October, we might have news that might make our budget processing look different? Uh, no, no, I have no um, anticipation of anything different than what we see now. Um, okay. But we're, we're trying to acknowledge that in a short period of time, it's really hard to get a budget done and asking for a very deep reduction in any one department or all departments just would be very difficult for them to execute in a couple of weeks. So I just, um, I don't see I think, Commissioner how it's going to get easier. I just, that's what I'm just, I don't see how it's going to get easier later than what we might need to be thinking about right now doing both. But so one of my other questions would be is uh, what I had written down was, how are we going to see the reflection of the COVID one, two and three direct dollars in these budgets that are there now as a part of the, both the skinny and the other budget, because that's going to have a big flow. And, and if we're making reductions over here, how are they going to, how are they going to um, achieve the mission of fulfilling what those COVID direct dollars were meant to do if we're, if we're making reductions. So all of those things need to be taken into account as I'm sure you know. Yeah, agreed. And I mean, as I think I said, I don't know, last time or at some point, I mean, this coming year is going to be, I mean, to your point, bizarre in that on the one hand, it's gonna be lean times, general fund, uh, key fund in particular, um, education fund. But on the other hand, it's going to be boom times and that there's going to be right. you know, a billion or more, two billion in total, you know, coursing through Vermont. So yes, uh, you know, th there will be some departments that have an awful lot of federal funding that, you know, like the, 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 we've never DOL. seen before. Uh, but their general funding is going to be reduced. What I would say though, a specific answer to your question, I mean, one of the challenges for um, designing an FY21 budget will be to see how we can um, kind of achieve general fund savings or take back general fund and put in coronavirus relief fund. Um, and that, that's going to be one of the challenges that we anticipate will help get us through FY21. Uh, mm -hmm. Within FY20, some of that uh, relief fund money is making its way into our budgets. Um, for example, I use transportation, maybe it's the most clear, roughly a little over $6 million um, of the transportation budget for FY20 uh, has been spent um, on COVID-19 emergency response, for example, 
cars, uh, watching cars at the border, getting license plates, um, responding to uh, various uh, unique challenges at rest areas and the like. So, you know, th that is getting into the FY20 mm -hmm. budget and will help us end the year in balance, but not in a major way. I think the more major um, appearance of that fund will be in FY21. So thank you. Um, I, I know that we're sort of cusping now on the, I picked this up and I don't know, it might've been even you that said it, but I, I'm not sure that we're, you know, there's first relief, recovery, reform. And so the relief is, is flowing. We're now setting the stage of the recovery. Right. But I think we're just, you know, where I come from is how do we, how do we um, facilitate the recovery that we maximize where we want to go in reform? Because it's a little tough to reform after you've spent uh, X and, and Y, and maybe later on you're not, that won't be a part of the reform piece. But all right, that aside, I was, there's my second and final question, then I'll go, is there's this possibility of a second wave coming just when, you know, the fall into the, into the, you know, Thanksgiving time is around then, that, um, preparing for the potential of how we can be positioned to be ready for something that occurs. Because we, because you guys have, everybody's done a really good job so far of being able to, to do this on the fly, but you know, are we going to just repeat it? Uh, tough question to answer. Yeah, I know. I just, it's in the back of my mind every day that we try to we're planning constantly thinking that the the landscape is going to stay stable. And and I, 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 I'm concerned that, I mean, it's always gonna be a little unstable, but this level of disruption, but we're, we need to have sort of the plan B for the f another wave. Right, agreed. Okay, thank you. Okay, I have um, Dave, Marty, yours is back down, your oh. one up and Mary. <laughs> Dave? Yes, uh, thank you. I'm gonna lower my hand. Um, Adam, would you, uh, and, and the administration may also be doing this, you may not be at liberty to give the details, however, would you see as a friendly amendment or welcome proposals that might, uh, in the skinny bill, suggest spending the COVID uh, relief dollars um, targeted towards sectors of the economy that have been significantly damaged due to the pandemic um, that one would not want to delay on because businesses might not be there come September, October, or November. Um, I don't want to give examples just, just because, but, but you can imagine them as well as right. I can. Would, would that be welcome? And then, and then let me just, um, picking up on what Diane was saying, um, there's management of this situation and there's leadership, and this is not a criticism, um, but the, the leadership part is uh, what direction do we want Vermont's economy to move into? If, we're, if we do have the flexibility to, uh, if the feds do give the flexibility to use um, the COVID dollars to replace revenues, that's, that would consume a large amount of the dollars on the table. If we don't, however, we could be looking at sending a large quantity of dollars back to Washington. Many might suggest that that's not a smart thing to do because this could be a once in a hopefully lifetime uh, opportunity, because we don't want more pandemics, to, to make some really uh, significant game changing, changing investments in Vermont, broadband, et cetera. So I guess, um, do you see the skinny bill as an opportunity to do some of that reform work that Diane alluded to? Uh, and protection, it's, it's an active discussion, I know within the legislature as well as within the administration. I can't uh, speak for the administration on a bird to see coronavirus relief fund appropriations. Um, however, if the skinny bill is essentially the last uh, monetary bill to go before uh, the legislature and pass, I would, I would 
say that that is one um, prime vehicle for CRF appropriations. I cannot uh, speak in that regard for the administration. I don't know what the plan is. May I, just to follow up, and I appreciate that, that, that I didn't expect you would be able to, but I'm trying to send a message here. Um, yeah. it, would, it would seem to me in a collaborative way, sooner than later for someone in the administration to say, you know, there are a couple of policy areas that we too are interested in. We'd like to frame them and shape them because these things take time um, and we want to work with you now as opposed to whatever the deadline is in June for the skinny bill or whenever uh, we're working, that's all. It would just seem to make sense or they're, gonna, they're going to germinate up through our policy committees. And um, uh, I'm, I'm trying to avoid a controversial, maybe that's impossible and that's okay, um, but rather do it a, a collaboratively, that's all. And, and it would seem to me during the skinny bill and, and many others may disagree, maybe just let's do this mathematically 23% and wait and be done. But it would seem like there are opportunities that we could miss because we didn't act uh, in a fluid, uh, fluid way. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Dave. Marty and Chip, you had your hands up and they're down. So I'm assuming, okay. Uh, Mary? It feels like we're, there's a theme going here. I had not heard the expression response recovery reform. And I think it's interesting that in fact, maybe it ought to be response reform recovery in looking at the long term, how do we fundamentally change the way our, our systems are working and lay the reform work to um, facilitate that recovery. During this period of time, the state of Vermont and this administration have done some really extraordinary uh, work that has shown an opportunity for some of that reform work. And I'm thinking both of what has happened in the mental health field, where by assuring that people are housed um, and receiving services, because we had to do that to protect them, they are not landing in our hospitals, which means that that very expensive consumption of services, let alone, you know, the personal and, and you know, all of the other issues with allowing a crisis to go to a hospital level. And I am curious how we're going to continue standing up those systems that are enabling us to accomplish these outcomes that the administration must have thought were, were wise and valuable because they set them in motion how we're going to continue supporting them until we get to the structural changes. So how are we going to continue housing people to keep them out of hospitals and having services until we change the system? And I think we have to answer that question now, not in September for implementation at a later date. That, that was a question. Wow. <laughs> not, not one of my speeches. That was a tough one. Um, I do think that the um, kind of call it bridge funding was in part the purpose of the coronavirus relief fund to make sure that we are carrying out the functions of government while we think about and act on reforms that will make long-term lasting impact. Um, that I think was the intent and you know, that fund has been used in the emergency situation and I suspect it'd be used as a bridge to get us to the uh, reform efforts. But knowing that FY21 um, is really, I would say the on-ramp to FY22 when we run out of one-time money and we have to um, use only the resources that we have and generate through state funds, um, I would think that that work can't happen soon enough. Oh, 
Thank you for that. And, and I agree with you. And it's particularly because we begin to cross budgets. It's not just, for example, what the Department of Mental Health can do. It is what are they doing with DIVA? What are they doing with the health department? What are they doing with a whole array of different departments in order to get those outcomes? So just looking inside one budget for the savings, I, in fact, we may need to be looking at investments in one place because we know that we're going to get these long-term um, payoffs in other places. It's going to be right. challenging and interesting. Thanks. It's um, from the questions that the committee has brought up and, and knowing the work the administration has to do before we get a three quarter year budget or however many month budget in August or September. Um, it's, it's obvious that we're going to probably be working in July just for the committee to real, I, I don't see how we turn all this around without some meetings prior, um, knowing you know the changes that have been made in corrections, the, the changes that are happening now in judiciary, the changes, Mary, you talked about in mental health. Um, in, in order to, to be able to move a, a larger budget at the end of the year, there's a lot of foundation work we need to do prior to that. I guess I guess I was just hoping July wasn't in the picture, but it's like, you know, I'm off the fourth. <laughs> it's likely that we could. It's more than likely we will be meeting uh, for quite some time. Any other uh, questions for Adam or Rich, or and Matt? You're still with us, or Matt? So just uh, one comment, Madam Chair, on that. And you know, just so the committee's aware, in uh, late summer, uh, we will be doing a full year FY21 budget, as um, Rich has pointed out to me, mm -hmm. in that the, we're, we're getting a, a, a one quarter budget out of the gates, but in the late summer, we're gonna be working on a full year budget that may accept all the changes in Q1 or change all the changes in Q1. Um, but it'll be a full year budget that we'll be doing. Right, right. That's what I'm anticipating. And so if we if we get the um, forecast in, I think it's August 15th in mid-August, what are you looking at timing to have a budget to us um, with, with your proposals? Um, <laughs> well, uh, clearly we have to have something by the end of just uh, September, um, and we have to leave time for us to debate and, and come to consensus and the like. So our hope is that by the very last days of August or the very first days of September, we have something for you. Uh, that could be a challenge in that the e-board is meeting, I believe, the second week of August. I'm not sure exactly when, but it's gonna be mid-August. So we would have to turn that around uh, pretty quickly. Um, but we will be having discussions with our agencies and departments this summer. So my hope is that uh, we can do that. Um, and, you know, I, I would say probably early September would be target for when we have some in front of you. So that, that goes back to my timing issue, Adam. If we get it in early September and the budget that we're looking at now, the skinny budget expires or only goes through September 30th, if we receive something from you, let's say on December 3rd or 4th, I don't know when Labor Day is, for the House to do their work and vote and then send it to the Senate for them to do their work and then to conference out the differences, we're already into October and we haven't even gotten it to the governor for a signature with the amount of days that he needs to consider signing it. And so the timing is already off and our skinny budget may need to go out past September 30th, or does need to, uh, unless we're getting a budget from the administration around August 16th. I just think that would be challenging with the e-board around that. Now we can be, you know, one thing to discuss, maybe we move the e-board meeting up, but I think the economists would protest that they're barely right. going to have um, deferred revenue um, coming in by the end of July. And so they're not going to have a read on how the FY20 revenue ended and 
So we're bumping up against some time constraints. And if we are in 2021, we're going to have to move fast on what could be a very yeah. But even but even fast, giving the House two weeks to turn around the work, including the votes, and that gives the Senate one week, and then it gives us one week to conference. That that doesn't even begin to seem realistic, and so this. The, the, the skinny proposal in front of us now probably needs to go out to October, the end of October, realistically. Right. Um, so it's something that we- I, That I don't know. I, yeah. I would know where the timing that. doesn't work. I mean, it's clear that the timing doesn't work for, the, for everything to get done in a month or less than a month for House yeah, would, Conference would Governor. I mean, timing is such that, you know, typically we have e-board meeting in mid-January and we drop a button in a week of that if uh, less. Uh, and the magnitude of the information this year is substantial. And so I'm not, I don't, I yeah. just don't want to make it, you have to back out of, um, but, you know, we, we can move quickly when we need to. This is not unusual that the information that's going to be coming at us in early August about July payments I mean, might have substantial changes in the e-board forecast that would require mm -hmm. us to make substantial changes in our budgeting. And I'm just a little reluctant to commit, you know, that we the e-board meeting of dropping a budget if we have to make that many, you know, dramatic changes. Mm -hmm. And I fully understand that. I'm just saying we all need more time. Diane? Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to jump in yeah. on there because the other thing that we're not taking into it, this is going to be a very large impacting budget directional change. We have to schedule public hearings. There has to be, has to be opportunity for the public to weigh in and have had time to review and comment both to you and uh, to us that also has to be i'm i'm leaning at the moment and now i'm just spitballing that maybe the skinny budget needs to be more of a six month kind of hint with big changes coming october do, do you know what i mean i don't i don't think we should be putting ourselves in a september 30th box with dramatic changes that need to occur i think we should keep that in our skinny budget could become a slightly more robust, fuller flesh budget. <laughs> COVID-related snacking. <laughs> All right, I'm stopping. Marty? Well, based on that discussion, I was going to suggest maybe that we make the skinny budget go through the end of October as opposed to September. Uh, in which case the administration, we'd all have time to think about things after you finally get a forecast in the middle of August um, and not have to produce a new budget by the end of September. We would have to produce a new budget by the end of October, um, which I think at least gives us a little bit more time and yet it's not the full half year as Diane just suggested. I'm thinking maybe it should be a third of a year as opposed to a quarter of a year. That's all. Yeah. These are all things that, that we'll discuss and we'll bring the Joint Fiscal Committee into, I mean, the Joint Fiscal Office into, um, with help us with the timing issues. But uh, Diane brought up a good point about um, uh, public response. Not only is there public response for the legislature, but the administration has that uh, commitment to the public as well that allows for, um, you know, time. Uh, but. What's clear is we have a lot of work to do. We have a little time to do it. And um, it appears it's going to be over the summer, quite a bit of it, uh, which is not a problem, but you know, the legislature has typically never been in session during the summer, uh, especially during an election year. Um, any other thoughts? We have uh, had the administration for an hour and I'm sure they have a lot of work to do and the governor is on um, one of his, um, news calls. Um, so if there's no further questions, Adam will be in touch regarding um, timing and, and what is exactly in the in the pieces. 
um, to make sure this rolls out um, in the best way it can uh, for the administration, the legislature, and for Vermonters. Adam, are you anticipating coming in this week uh, to present um, uh, I the do. proposal? I do. Okay, you are okay. We have. Do you, we're going to schedule for Thursday or Friday? Do you have a preference? Um, can I get back to you later on today with that? Sure. But yes, I mean, for sure. Then, and you know, hopefully sooner. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome, Adam. Thank you, Rich. Matt, good to see all of you. So see you guys. We're going to go to our next item um, on the agenda. We have a federal funds update from Stephanie. And Stephanie, the doorbell just rang, and I know you just entered our meeting. Yes. <laughs> Highlight of my day when the doorbell rings. It's like, yes. <laughs> I don't hear it. <laughs> well, you know, before, I don't know the host. Before we're, before we're done, I, Teresa needs to make everybody host and so and then have some plan to ring in because it's just, it's it's like it, it brings some levity, it brings some excitement or happiness to the day that you get a visitor. Um, so welcome, Stephanie. We're going to move sure. to the piece on the agenda and then we'll come back and do some committee uh, discussion about uh, timing issues and what we see in the two pieces of the budget. Okay, um, there's a document I sent to Teresa um, and it's up on our website and it's, there's a link in it to, from the, uh, the update you'll get from Steve Klein tomorrow. And I've been updating this sheet for several weeks. Um, the source of the information is FFIS. Every Friday, late in the day, they send out their update of um, the funding across all the Corona, virus, COVID-19 response pieces of legislation and funding that is associated with that. Um, the source of the allocations by state or territory, um, in some cases they started out being FFIS, FFIS estimates, um, congressional committee estimates, um, and they get updated to actual awards from the the departments, the US uh, government departments um, over time. And so mostly these are up to date with the most current estimates. In a few cases, there are still some, um, you know, uh, congressional committee estimates for some of the newer pieces as well. And so I thought I'd just, uh, you know, walk through the sheet with you um, so you understand what's on here. It's very similar to the tracking sheet and it's the same underlying database that the, uh, executive branch is using, they uh, uh, turn it into a little uh, sort of uh, graphic um, at the bottom of their sheet. Um, I've been just doing it as a list um, week to week. And uh, for the past few weeks, I've been actually trying to understand what's changed. If, a, if an estimate has changed from one week to the next for the Vermont amount. And so what I thought I'd do here is, is walk through and, and note the pieces that have changed, uh, particularly this week. There was one change last week um, that I'll point out as well. Um, but it, it's set up, um, it, it's set up with, a, there's a bit more information. There's a whole, you can have all 50 states and, and territories um, in the underlying data set. But what we post online is simply this Vermont only picture. Um, and so the first two and a half pages are these grant amounts that would be coming out from the federal departments to Vermont. And I'll stop there for a moment to see if there's any, any comments or questions before we start rolling through. So Stephanie, at the very top one from the treasury is the, the, the most the well, Sierra, yeah. the 1.25 billion. All of the numbers down below are not related to the 1.25. They're completely different sources of money. Right. <laughs> For all individual, grant amounts, estimates of grant amounts that the state will be getting for various programs under various departments. And they're so in the, addition. the top one is the trend. Yeah, they're in addition to, yes. And some of them are coming through the state and some of them are going direct to other institutions. So we can, we can look at that as we go along as well. 
Um, but the, the CRF, the first one, the Treasury. Well, I have a question first from Marty. I'm just my hand I'm trying to find it here. Marty, you, your hand is up. No question. Okay, uh, Dave. Uh, is this elsewhere on the web? I'm just trying to uh, more easily it, it blow is. it up and look at it. It's on the it, committee it, page as well. I, I just, didn't find it there. I'll, I'll go back and look. Thank yeah. you. You might need to refresh if you had it up earlier because I put it up halfway through the meeting. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. It's okay. <laughs> okay, I don't um, have any other questions, Stephanie, so let's just start um, okay. walking. So, so that first one is a, is a grant that we have in our coffers now from Treasury um, and it doesn't, and I'm not going to spend any time that nothing has changed around that one. Um, the, you know, the, the continued um, FAQs and, and, you know, trying to suss out the, the boundaries of the areas of use of that are one of your struggles um, or our collective struggle um, and how that will um, help with um, the, the budget building which is a challenging budget building. I was listening to your conversation off and on for the past hour uh, of starting with that one quarter bill um, and um, going to the big bill, hopefully in August, once we have a, a very, uh, not perfect, but better forecast, official forecast update. Um, the next group is from the Department of Education. Um, there's four funding streams here. Two of them, the bottom two, are going directly to the institutes of higher education. Um, so the $21 million was spread across all the um, uh, colleges and universities in Vermont. Um, and I don't think we have any historically black colleges or universities in Vermont, but I don't know what an MSI is, but um, about $365,000 on that bottom one uh, flowed to so, so probably some small number of, of education, uh, higher ed institutions in Vermont. Um, the biggest one is that K through 12 fund, the $31 million. That's the funds that are coming, uh, the, the our agency of education has, uh, is in the process of, or has made the application for those funds and 90% of those funds go out to schools and they're going out to schools based on the Title I formula. And so there's been some discussion um, around um, how these funds may or may not uh, be part of solution to the Ed Fund revenue um, challenges. Because um, the, these funds probably won't be in hand in the local districts until after the start of the fiscal year. Um, so that's the, that's the big lump there. And then there's the 4.4, uh, nearly $4.5 million that is the governor's fund. And that is um, a fund that it can be used for any of the other education purposes. Could, could go out to K through 12, could be used at higher ed. Um, it's a bit broad um, and it's, um, the, we, you know, the, there's been a lot of applications from various entities asking for a share of that, um, various education entities. I've seen several letters sent um, by independent schools. Um, the, I think both UVM and state colleges, et cetera. Um, and I don't know that there's any decisions made about that yet. I don't, um, I don't know off the top of my head what the application process for that $4.4 million is. Um, we can find out where, where the status of that money um, coming in is. Um, but that's the, that's the education group. Um, can I ask a and question, there was no Stephanie, on the education yes. group? We keep hearing about the $23 million that is going out to schools. Is that within the it, 30? It, it, it's actually $28 million. It's the 90% of the 31. Okay, so thank you. The 31 is the amount for Vermont. 10% of it can stay at the agency for admin and other determined uses, but 28 of that, 27 point some high number, um, has to go out to the, to the schools. It goes out to the supervisory unions 
And it's based on the federal Title I formula. The way that $27, $28 million will go out to the schools is based on a federal formula. That's a requirement. Thank you. I'm not so seeing it. So let's continue. OK. So um, now we'll start into the HHS department uh, sub, uh, sub <laughs> subgroups. Um, Children and families. This um, is a, a group of grants that have grown over the several weeks. Um, and you see here, child care and development block grant, that, that number hasn't changed. The big change, the big disappointing change um, over uh, the weekend when I updated this is in that community services block grant. Um, that community service block grant, when it was initially an estimate from a congressional committee when the CARES Act first passed, was about $5 million for Vermont. Um, and so in the actual awards that were in the update um, on Friday evening, the Vermont amount has dropped um, to this $1.3 um, million. And that's that's a lot less than what, and this this is a grant that goes out to the CAP agencies generally. And so this that, that was the biggest um, sort of downward adjustment I've seen um, over the several weeks from estimates, initial estimates to um, the grant amount. Um, so that's that's the first one that I would note is one that has changed from previ previous iterations of this sheet. And it's a, it's a disappointing um, change downward. Um, the LIHEAP piece, that actually went up a smidge over the weekend, just a revised estimate. Um, the family violence prevention piece, that has come down a little bit from what was originally an FFI estimate, FFIS estimate. Um, the component pieces for runaway and homeless youth haven't changed over the several weeks and the Head Start piece has not changed. But um, you can see where the primary recipient is um, for these um, different uh, grants. Kimberly has a question, Stephanie. Sure. Yeah. Um, hi, Stephanie. Looking at that community services block grant, I had heard that that was a quote technical glitch and that there were efforts underway to fix it. And so that may be an ever evolving number, the 1.372. Um, it, it, I, I hadn't heard that, but I hadn't actually take, I hadn't actually um, sort of investigated that all this week. I did look at the, the list, the, the state's allocation list um, and if there's a, the question is, is it a glitch for Vermonters? Is it a glitch across um, the entire way they calculated that? Um, I did see that the list for all the states and territories actually added up to the total um, uh, billion dollars or so that was in that community service of block grant. So I hope I hope you're correct, and I hope it does sw swing in the other direction. Interesting. All right. Direction. <laughs> Yeah. Now, I'll try to follow up on that. And the other um, question I just wanted to ask, it's uh, on the top line, the Child Care and Development Block Grant, looking at how far out those numbers go in terms of obligation, I often hear the word leveraging those dollars in reference to that amount of money in particular. And I'm wondering if you can shed any more light for me on um, so the budgetary mechanics there. So we, we do get, the, there's an underlying child care and development block grant. And so the, this one just comes in on that same, it's the same grant, it's just an increase in the al allocation. What I understand is despite the fact that you could obligate it out and have to have it liquidated by 2023, and that's sort of bad typing on my date out there, um, it, it is because we have undertaken this um, uh, uh, funding for, the uh, child care uh, industry in in the a large chunk of the money that was approved in the JFC plan last week that was submitted by the administration estimated 17 million dollars or so um, through mid June or so um, it, that's net of this money so they were applying that is my understanding that the administration is applying this 4.4 as well as the um, CRF money as part of the solution, the short-term solution to the childcare, um, uh, keeping them afloat as much as possible. 
Right, right. So and every, so, everybody... sorry. No, no, go ahead. So that's that's my understanding is that this this money is actually being applied as we speak to the to the child care issues. And do we have? And again, maybe I'm sorry to keep talking so much. I know we have a lot to cover. Um, in terms of a spend rate, would I have to go to the agency just to see where that where that stands currently in terms of invoices going out? And we've had, as we know, in other systems, problems with monies going out. And I'm wondering if this falls into the potential problematic area. Um, I, in terms of money going out from the agency to the child care centers, that would be in terms of where we stand week to week. Um, that would be from directly from the agency. Um, my understanding is in the entire estimate, this 4.4 is counted as a resource in that entire estimate for child care help. Um, so that the, that the amount of money that is going out for, from, mid, from mid March till sometime in June um, would include this 4.4 in it. Okay, thank you. Okay, should we um, move to community living? Sure. So there were no changes um, under the community living. These numbers have stayed pretty steady um, over the past several weeks. Um, and you can see the amounts that are going out um, for all the various, uh, there's been two rounds of the congregate and home delivered meals, um, support services, um, protection of vulnerable older Vermonters, family caregivers. Uh, centers for Independent Living, I, it, that goes to nonprofits. I don't know if it passes through us or not. I can find that out, but that's, um, that's the only one that doesn't come right into the state and go out if it does. Um, but Are there any monies in here that would, do, it, do, do the adult days fit into any of these categories? Uh, I, they may fall into the aging and disability resource centers, that $300,000. Um, protection of vulnerable older Americans, I'm not sure. Um, but that would be probably the um, supportive services. I'll find out. Um, Thank you. Yeah. I'll, I'll find out if the, they all seem to be coming in on, uh, they're not, uh, they're, they're existing grants that come in that are just increased. None of these I think are like a newly created grant. Um, at the federal level. Um, These are all dollars that we anticipated coming in anyway? Not, no, it's just that they're, they're not creating a new, a new line item. They're, oh, they're just no, an okay. add they're, to an existing they, federal line they, item. That's all. Okay, I I, and when, okay I, when you said they're not new, okay, I thought you were going so, down a different So just to, be, just to be clear, when they, are, when they are coming in on an existing federal line item, they don't go to JFC, they just go through an excess receipt process. Right, exactly. So you won't see them at JFC. You may see them come up in the context of the 21 budget when we get to that, the big bill part of the 21 budget in August. You may see them in that context. Um, but if, if they're already spent, if they've already been sent out it, between the end of 20 and the early part of 21, you may not see them in that 21 budget. You would just be uh, asking the, the state departments to report on the use of these funds um, and how they were distributed. Thank you. Um, the, the next block is CDC and the CDC testing funds, that $55 million, that was a new amount of money this week showing up. This is on the, this funding is from the 3.5 bill, the, the one after the CARES Act that had the, the testing and tracing piece in it. Um, this, uh, this estimate, um, is, is an estimate from uh, congressional sources, according to FFIS. It's not um, actual CDC award amounts yet. The, the previous grant awards are, are the award amounts. And my understanding that the, the first 4.9 and the second 5.4 have been drawn into the state and are being applied um, in, it, at the, to the Department of Health at the, health and emergency response um, portion of, of um, activity. But that's a pretty big, that's a very large chunk of money, the testing money. Um, 
Mm -hmm. And there's no there's no guidance yet available on that. It's simply the estimate that it's the first time that FFIS has been carrying that estimate. So Stephanie, for that amount of money, can every Vermonter get tested? Do we have the tests that would allow? <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I, I, and I do think this must be a combination of testing in and tracing uh -huh. um, to be that size, but um, the health department would be, I, I think it's bigger than what they anticipated potentially. Um, if this correct, if this allocation is correct. Um, it's one where I would say um, because it's from a congressional source and not from an actual agency award source that it's when we could see a change in the number over time. Okay. As, as we get closer to having the award made to the state. Thank you. Yep. Uh, next group, and it goes on to the next page, are the HRSA um, Health Resource. Uh, I forgot what the F stands for, administration. <laughs> um, but you see there's a variety of um, programs where Vermont did not get an allocation, uh, poison control centers, the Part A, Ryan White, HIV AIDS funding, a um, little bit of money on part B and the other parts of Ryan White funding. Um, community health centers um, had a couple rounds in the, in the COVID uh, two bill, the family's first bill, and then a bigger chunk in the CARES Act. Um, they're also getting a test capacity chunk of funding, same source as the CDC test capacity. That's a three point, it, a federal 3.5 bill um, allocation. Um, and then if you scroll on to the next page, telehealth, we did not get a piece of that um, funding, which was going through institutes of higher education. Um, little bit of small rural hospital improvement money that's been on there for several weeks. And then this next group, the geriatric, all these health workforce pieces, um, AHEC, Geriatric AHEC Centers of Excellence, veteran nurses in primary care and registered nurses in primary care. Those were those five areas were all new to the tracking sheet this week. The only allocation that we, the state of Vermont got was the AHEC $95,000. That seems to be the standard across all the states with AHEC. Very few got higher than the $95,000 allotment. Um, I don't, very few, there's only a handful of states that have center of excellence programs that were getting part of that grant. But the other workforce enhancement and primary care pieces, um, I, don't, I don't know what the nature of the, those programs are that why Vermont did not get an allocation in those. Um, we're not the only state that got a single allocation in these workforce programs, but several states do have two and sometimes three of these allocations so it would be interesting to know why we don't um we don't qualify for any of these programs um dave has a question stephanie yep uh, thank you um stephanie i see asterisks beside the community health centers up above under her so you know what those do you know uh, I did a few weeks ago, and I can look on the sheet. Um, not, I think it's not meaningful, or yeah. And then uh, yeah, my it, other it, question it, is, it, it's part of the FFIS underlying database, um, and I, it, um, I will, I will find out and circle back with you what the asterisk means. Not meaningful. Don't worry. Um, I, I have a uh, feeling. I have a feeling every single one of them has an asterisk on it. Um, <laughs> and I don't. I, yeah. I'll find out if that actually ties to a, a note. I haven't. I don't think so. I think it's part of how they use their coding. Okay. But, yep. And is the money uh, a pass through directly to, to our FQHCs or does it go into DIVA and then do they redistribute it? No, if you if you switch, uh, uh, Teresa, if you just flip up to the bottom of the next, the page above. Um, so those, all those community health centers, those are, I believe are going direct to the FQHCs. I don't think they pass through the state budget at all. I think Do you know, um, yep, my FQHC, uh, not mine, but the one in my community, um, receives some retainer funding through DIVA. And um, I think that was just an advance on their prospective payment. So I guess, I guess they don't have to pay that back per se. It may be adjusted if they don't have enough claims behind it. But I've been reading the, F, the uh, frequently asked questions on this. And there's a lot of latitude, and I guess 
um, each each one has the independence, uh, discretion, decision making to do as they want in accordance with the guidelines um, with the money. I I am not the best person to ask that. <laughs> that be in the health department. Um, you probably would want Georgia Meharis from Bi State, who represents yes. these organizations, to Thanks. to weigh I'll, in on that. <laughs> I'll send her a note. Thank you so sure. much. Dave, I don't see any other questions, Stephanie, so let's continue. Okay. So, um, back on to the next page. SAMHSA, um, there's the $2 million grant that you uh, two weeks ago approved in the Joint Fiscal Committee um, that um, you actually saw that pop up on the budget adjustment as well. Um, you saw it because that was a new grant line item, you approved it and they put it in for spending authority into the budget adjustment. Um, it came into the health department, but a chunk of it had to go um, as an interdepartmental transfer over to mental health. Um, and then uh, Office of the Secretary in AHS. So these are where the, um, it was the $100 billion pot for provider relief funds in the CARES Act. Um, and these are some of the awards to date out of that pot. Um, the FFIS sheet is not yet carrying the second part of the general allocation. So several weeks ago, there was the $30 billion allocation. And we uh, knew from comparison to other states that there was something wrong in the calculation because of the way they were treating the ACO and not counting the Medicare money that flowed through the ACO, our understanding, and they've made a, a second $20 billion general allocation. And our understanding is our share of that is about $16 million. It's just not the detail on um, either the state portions of that or the um, underlying detail has not been um, shared by HHS yet. Um, we have the $54 million that was part of the original 30 billion. And we think there's another 16 million on top of that for a $70 million state allocation out of what is half of that pot as a general allocation. Uh, Green Mountain Care Board has collected from the hospitals and only the hospitals, their share of these different distributions. And we can share that with you. Um, and so, so those monies have come out, even though we don't have the detail on the second $20 billion piece yet from FFIS. And I don't, it, it, we've been asking for several weeks and I, it, I just haven't seen it on any of their data sets. I did not check um, HHS's data set since last week. So um, I'll, I'll check again and maybe it's up there now, but um, we didn't get any of the high impact funds. Those were funds that went for the highest COVID-19 impacted states and, and localities, hospitals um, and providers. So we did not get any of those dollars. We did get $74 million under the rural provider relief funds. Um, and those are in the, um, the majority of those are to hospitals. Um, and those are in the Green Mountain Care Board's tally so far of what hospitals have received. And then there's a, a $479,000 hospital preparedness um, award that's it was early on in the process. Um, so that's, um, I think there's a very small amount of, um, it's something in the 20, 20 billion dollar range left to be released from the hundred billion dollar provider relief fund pot at the federal level. Um, and I don't know what form that those remaining provider relief funds will take. I don't know if those are going to be sort of um, held until we know if there's, you know, second wave or a uh, little bit more time uh, passed before those are released. But I think in my accounting, I was up to about 76 or 78 um, billion dollars of what I could see had been released out of that hundred out of that hundred billion dollar pot to providers. And those are go, those go direct to the providers. They're not they're not flowing through the state. Any questions on that from members? I'm not seeing any. Um, 
Is it within some of these dollars, Stephanie, that that providers can use to um, boost pay due to hazard duty? Would any of these monies be available for that? They could. These are, as my understanding is that we're direct support to providers because providers had significant loss of revenue um, mm -hmm. and significant costs, um, you know, securing PPE, um, you know, uh, change in protocols, things like that. So I, I do think that a provider could um, choose to use these funds if that was in, you know, in the balance of their calculations to do so, to to provide increased um, provider pay. I know that there, it, uh, my understanding is that UVM Medical Center did provide one week of additional pay for folks that were under uh, $99,000 a year in, in annual um, wage, I assume. Um, th that, you know, when you, when you see the, the list of, of distribution of these dollars, you know, there are, the hospitals are the largest share of them. They have the highest, because you know, it's generally based on, um, although my understanding is the rural hospitals are based on costs, the, the general allocation is based on Medicare um, revenue. And so um, you, and that those general allocations went out to a thousand providers in Vermont. And so there are some very, very small um, allocations within, within those general, that, that big Vermont general allocation um, to individual providers. Uh, Dave has a question. Um, could you ask AHS to give us uh, information on, on those funds that went out, how much was used for? So these funds didn't funding? go through AHS. These funds went direct uh, so, from, so they, from HHS to, yeah, to the hospitals you. or to the providers. Thank you. So who and that's would why know if they, go ahead, Stephanie. So, so we know that the Green Mountain Care Board is having the hospitals report on what they got, but that's only, you know, 14 entities. Um, the, 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 the like home health or nursing homes or other, other providers, independent practices, um, those, there is a data set up at the federal level at HHS. It just hadn't been updated for a while the last time I checked. Um, well, I, yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to get yeah. ahead, but it's all, all related either. Our Commerce yeah. Committee either needs to be aware of these details, or if we do get S346, the hazard pay bill, we, I would think we would want to, because if, if many of the healthcare providers at least have already um, received reimbursement for that, you wouldn't necessarily want to do it twice. Does that make any sense, no. Stephanie? Well, it makes sense. Uh, the, my understand the only the only hospital I know that have, some hospitals have taken pay cuts because they were concerned about their budgets. I know that the only hospital I've heard of that has done a bonus type or hazard pay is the UVMMC that one week piece. Um, the 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 issue it's it's different provider by provider type. Um, yes, it is. Yep. I was you know, thinking the, more nursing homes yeah. and home health and, and the non-hospitals. Yep. Yeah. So um, I know that some of the applications for extraordinary relief for nursing homes, because mm -hmm. the 346 piece was in play and that applied to the, the, the $25 cap did not apply to the nursing homes in it does not in that in the essential worker right. bill. So mm -hmm. the agency, I believe, was pulling out anything that was related to hazard pay in those extraordinary relief requests. Um, and they were they were very small, modest amounts. Uh, it, so that was the, that's, that's what I was aware of. I, hadn't, I haven't sort of circled back on that subject for a couple of weeks, but um, the, the it sort seems of- like, <laughs> yep. uh, Stephanie, the, It seems like, Stephanie, it seems like there was the um, um, retainer retainer payments to agencies. And then there's this direct funding to agencies. And now you're mentioning the uh, agency pulling out, the HS agency, pulling out some of the uh, money uh, for the hazard pay. So it, it's just a spreadsheet that maybe shows who got what would probably be necessary, wouldn't it? Um, 
it would it, it's, it's the the construct of of what um my understanding and this has to be checked with AH, ahs because we pulled the nursing home separately and did and took the the, the the cap off when the essential worker bill left the senate mm -hmm. that when a nursing home is coming for extraordinary relief if in that ask for extraordinary relief they had a line item for hazard pay that's what was taken out all the other costs for extraordinary relief stayed in their their request for extraordinary relief um and so i the status of that versus the status of where 346 so they're sort of in um i think that the agency was concerned if 346 was going to go they didn't want to double up on the extraordinary relief so Understood. and i apologize i didn't mean to get ahead of us on yeah that, Thank you. Th thank you. Yeah. So, so it does have to be understood what 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 has or is potentially going out for different provider types um, for for hazard pay. Um, but that the the only we do know that some grocery stores have given um, hourly yeah. boosts. But we the only the only hospital I'm aware of is is the UVMMC. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Peter, you. you did have your hand up, but it's down. Do you have a question? Yeah, it is down. Stephanie Stephanie reiterated that the only hospital to date is, is UVMMC. I know the two okay. hospitals I'm familiar with are dealing with major budget deficits and, and are not talking about uh, about any type of, uh, of pay boost, pay bump. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And just to be clear, in S346, it would only be people making up to $25 an hour even in the hospitals that would qualify under the 346, it's only the nursing homes because of the, the very severe sort of workforce crunch there that as it came out of the Senate, it had uh, no cap on it. Nursing home and home health because of the nursing situation. Thank you, Stephanie. All right, so we are down into labor at this point. Yeah, um, the, the short-term compensation piece, um, that was a new ad, this $183,000 that is potentially available to Vermont, that was a new ad this week. Um, the rest are uh, UI administration supplemental. Um, I think these are numbers that will change or can be drawn, you know, it, it, it's a matching um, arrangement with the UI administration. And this is not, this is not anything to do with the actual benefits. Um, I'm carrying a blank at the bottom of the sheet when we finally understand how much additional federal um, UI relief came into the state. Um, the justice assistance grants, um, those are underway. The application for those are underway. I think you heard from Sarah Clark um, in the budget adjustment that, um, that those, those applications are in. Um, those haven't changed in several weeks. Um, uh, the I USDA. Question, uh, before you move to USDA, Mary has a question on the justice. Sure. Stephanie, would you remind me of what is eligible for the JAG grants? Um, let's see if we can broadly. That's I'm um, not off the top of my head, but I can click on the link and look. <laughs> is is that the link um, that I can click on? I yeah. can click on it myself. Never yeah. mind. Thank you. Overtime equipment, uh, personal hiring supplies, training, travel, medical needs of inmates and state school. Um, that's, the, that's the quick list off the top. Um, USDA, this is the funding that would flow through to the food bank. Um, some of this is in the form of commodities, not actual dollars, the TFAP pieces. Um, so, uh, there, the, right, this might be the actual, these might be the actual admin dollars that came through. The commodities might not be showing here. It's just allocation for Vermont for the commodity piece. I'm sorry. Um, and then the commerce pieces, um, the fisheries were new last week. It's not a surprise that Vermont did not get <laughs> any of the fisheries money, um, the Homeland Security pieces um, have been in for several weeks. 
Um, new this week, when we get down to HUD at the bottom of the page is round two of the CDBG, the Community Development Block Grant. Um, so that I didn't realize there was going to be a round two, but we have a, a $2 million allocation in round two for the statewide CDBG increase. Um, and then is there more on HUD? Oh, there's the, uh, at the top of the next page, the emergency solutions grants. And you have seen, I believe, that grant um, is part of the housing um, that you see in uh, DCF Economic Services, the, the, the emergency housing, um, the state emergency solutions grant, I think is being applied to the emergency housing program that we have now in the, in the hotels. And I think it's my understanding, we have about 110 hotels that are participating in that, or motel, hotel motels that are participating in that right now that will run through the end of June. Um, and so the, the amount that you saw, if you were reading the JFC plan that was approved last week of the $166 million out of CRF, there's an emergency housing piece in that. Um, and so it's the two pieces together here, the emergency solutions grant and the piece in the CRF that make up the total of the estimate of emergency housing for the period through the end of June. Um, the tenant-based rental assistance, this is one that was also dropped. It was dropped last week um, and it, it, it was dropped about in half. We thought it was gonna be about two and a half million dollars initially. Um, and then when the awards were, were um, Actually, I don't know if this one's based on awards or just a new estimate. I think it's based on a new estimate. The Vermont share of that allocation dropped from about two and a half million dollars to this one point two million dollars. Um, transportation hasn't changed. Um, it's all um, the, the nearly twenty million dollars in the public transit line, and then the nine million dollars that you see for airports, and those are going directly to the airport authorities. Um, $3 million in the election security grants, a handful of dollars across uh, sort of um, museums and libraries, endowment for the arts, endowment for the humanities. Um, not sure what the status of those dollars coming in yet are, if there's an application or if they're directly just um, distributed to the state to be distributed you know, to the organizations in the state. Um, and so that gives you that just under $1.6 billion in total in the grant allocations for the state. Um, not all of it flowing through the state coffers, but the vast majority of it is. And below that, I've been tracking, and FFIS has started tracking, how much uh, Paycheck Protection Program um, have come to Vermont banks. Um, so this one's a little bit trickier in terms of, we, we did very well in round one and we had a billion dollars of paycheck protection program grant loans that can become grants in the first round. In the second round through the 8th of May, um, we're at $204 million, a um, little bit up from last week, about $13 million higher than last week. And then the economic injury and disaster loans um, the first round of that, we had about $10 million. And so far in the second round of that, we're just under $30 million for uh, Vermont businesses through Vermont banks. Um, so some of this may be, um, you know, if a, if a business on the border actually does its business with a Vermont bank, it might show up here. Or if a Vermont business primarily uses a, a bank across the border, that, uh, it, that total may be showing up in a, in a, like New Hampshire or Mass or New York total. That's, a, that's what's a little bit hard about this one. Or you may have companies that do access paycheck protection in their own, in their, in their headquarters state, but they may be benefiting, you know, uh, in, a, a satellite of the company that's based in Vermont as well. Um, the municipal liquidity facility, which it sounds like from the treasurer is something Vermont's not likely to use much, but there's an allocation for Vermont there. And then below that are things that aren't showing up on the FFIS sheet 
yet. Um, and that's the FMAP increase that the $38 million, which is the through June estimate. If the president's emergency declaration extends past July 1st, that will put us into another quarter of something in the neighborhood of $19 million. Um, FEMA has yet to be determined how much the amount of money that's in that $166 million and elsewhere um, is going to be uh, uh, sort of sought by the state and various entities in the state. Um, the unemployment for Vermonters, um, the dust has to settle a little bit more there, but um, we'll track how much of that, uh, the $600 extra per week, what that adds up to for Vermont in total. Um, and then the last thing on here, it ties back to those um, grants to providers, those uh, provider relief funds. So in advance of those funds being paid out, um, the, the loans, advance payments were available to the hospitals in the state to the tune of $159 million. Um, and that's also something that the Green Mountain Care Board has been tracking. What, how much did a hospital get in an advance payment versus how much it got in the end, it, how much it's gonna end up having through those provider relief payments. And so that was just a way to advance that money more quickly to the hospitals. And that's the sheet. I've just been keeping track of it week to week, trying to find out what's a new thing that's been added and what's changed from previous estimates. Um, and it should provide you a good guideline um, um, when you do get to building the big bill um, of understanding what funds have flowed to the state and what that might mean for um, help in FY21 in the big bill. Thank you, Stephanie. Are there any final questions for Stephanie? It's a great document. Uh, just yeah. seeing out exactly where all the money has gone out when it doesn't flow through the state is a, a little bit more difficult. But yeah, but it's a, it's it gives you a sense of the scale of different mm -hmm. things like like the paycheck the paycheck protection program. I mean, to to the extent that those turn into grants or significantly turn into grants, that's an enormous amount of money into yes. the state. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, still some complications there. With that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not going to be as easy as... Uh, as Although the Wall Street Journal had an article today saying that, that, that Congress and I, I, is actually contemplating easing, you know, changing and making that easier to function for people. Yeah. Longer time, long longer time to spend the money, et cetera. So, so when that actually happens. Um, yeah, you it'll know, be good. <laughs> 1.25 billion as well. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, sure. I don't see any other questions. So I wanted to just do the schedule for the rest of the week with committee members. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to be going over two bills. Um, first, we're going to be going over uh, H6607 primary care bill. I know there's a lot of interest in this bill and by some committee members. Um, I will not be taking action on this bill tomorrow, but it's we need to get all of our questions out there and and determine um, next steps with with that bill. Uh, the capital bill is coming on at 930 and I would ask committee members to make sure you read through that today or tonight if you can. I would like to take action on the capital bill tomorrow unless there are large flags. So if you have a large red flag, let me know even at midnight tonight, um, preferably before the discussion tomorrow would be helpful. You may learn more as we're doing having the discussion, but if something's jumping out at you now, um, please let me know um, in advance if you could on that. And that will be our, our, our time tomorrow because we have, um, what is happening tomorrow? Um, there's a couple of, we had some conflicts with committee members, but also if you're on YouTube, you may want to join in at 12 o'clock. Uh, in the education committee, there's going to be testimony regarding higher education. And um, that is a topic that we're all following carefully, and we may want to jump in through YouTube to listen to that. Is that House Ed? House Ed? House Ed. Yes, House Ed. 
Um, we are not scheduled for um, Wednesday because we have the house floor at 11 and then back again at one. And um, then I have a meeting at four and a meeting at five and a dentist appointment all morning. Thursday, we'll meet at 8.30 to 10.30 and one o'clock to three. And then Friday, we'll jump on at 8.30, but we're back on the floor at 10 o'clock. And um, Thursday and Friday, we're going to do more testimony and work. Uh, Adam will be in with the administration's uh, proposal for the skinny budget. I'd also like to have um, JFO come in, uh, Steve and Maria and Stephanie, um, to talk about the timing issues because I'm really concerned with the timing issues. And also if we do need to make reductions in the budget, it seems like that that, that work would start um, and actually start happening, would have to start happening to realize the savings. And so I we need to have a long discussion about that. and and how long the skinny bill needs to be, whether the three months we can get our work done by September 30th through the House, the Senate and the governor, I think needs how many days for a signature? Five days? Doesn't, is it five? I don't know, five, thank you. Thank you, Linda. Um, actually, Teresa, why don't you unmute everybody? You would please. So the timing, I just don't, it gives us about eight days. Um, they themselves muted, so I can't unmute them. Oh, okay. It, at least it asked the question, would you like to be unmuted? <laughs> like just so we'll, we'll talk more about the timing and also how the reductions will work in light of the e-board and the, um, the forecast coming not until mid-August, which it really can't because that's the, the timing to get the best the best forecast indicator that we can. That takes us through the week. Um, on the floor on Wednesday, uh, you guys may be on your own for budget adjustment uh, for third reading. I don't foresee any problems. If I'm out of the dentist chair, I'll jump on. If I can't jump on, Mary, you'll, you will uh, be ready. You'll be ready with there. Um, their uh, answers to questions. Tomorrow, capital bill action I would like to take if we if it's ready and um, language is the other thing we can start looking at like we did with the budget adjustment. We went through all the language to determine what needed to be in and what needed to be out. Um, I think Stephanie and Maria have already Maria has already highlighted areas of language that would um, need to be in, and we can uh, go over that with Maria as well. And if there's any other small initiatives that we believe need to go in the budget adjustment, and Dave, you asked a question about um, adding CRF like we did in the budget adjustment to the skinny yeah. bill. I would anticipate if there are expenses that will be covered and have been identified that we will have a section just like we did in BAA. And, and if there's larger house initiatives that make it through the house that need to be reflected, if they're ready, then they would be identified as well. Hey, Kitty, tomorrow's, um, sorry, my video is not working for some reason. Um, tomorrow's discussion on uh, higher ed in the Ed committee, um, it's, are they going to be talking about bridge funding or the no? No, I think it's more um, what the future of higher ed in the. Um, I, I think it's more on what higher ed is going to look like uh, after the impact of COVID nineteen, the pressures on the systems. Um, I, I, I believe it's not going to be the bridge. Are we gonna? Are we talking about doing that in the skinny bill then, the bridge funding? Um, I'm not sure uh, on the timing of that piece yet. I don't think the the treasurer has completed her work on okay. her audit as well as the, um, the other group that is looking at the audit. And so until that information is complete and 
um, the committees of jurisdiction have, have started that conversation. I, I, I don't have an answer yet. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Um, <laughs> okay, I think that we can go offline. I think our, our meeting time is, uh, our meeting is complete. Okay, I'm gonna stop the live stream now. Thank you.